So here we are, one of the most uh, well-known passages of Scripture, perhaps. Perhaps as we read it to you, it sounded a little bit shorter than usual. All sorts of uh, people have made all sorts of suggestions, telling me it's the uh, topic of the most Christian books ever written. Would I like to borrow some? Very helpful. But what we need to know is what's Jesus' heart as he talks to his disciples upon this particular matter. So let's bow our heads in prayer before we start. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you've given us your word to teach us and instruct us and encourage us and help us. And we pray tonight that we'd learn something more about what you have for us. That whatever we think we know at the beginning, you teach us something more about yourself about your love for us and your care and your concern. That we'd be encouraged, that we'd want to know you more, we'd want to develop our own prayer lives through what we share, through ideas you place in our head by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we uh, look at this particular passage, as we think about uh, what the Lord's been asked to do and what his response is, there's a few things we need to get right right from the beginning. So first of all, we need to clarify what this passage is not about. It's a bit strange, isn't it? Because we want to know what it is about. But we're going to start with what it's not about. It's not about this. This, if you don't recognise it, is the bat phone. And every week when I was a lad, the bat phone would ring and for 30 minutes, Batman would sort out the problems that Commissioner Gordon had told him was going on. Every week, within 30 minutes, everything would be sorted out. Gotham City would be safe for the citizens to live. You know, if I was a citizen of Gotham City, I would have moved out ages ago because so much wrong stuff went on. But prayer is not a ring up, get it sorted, live your life again. That's not what it's about. That's not what it's there for. The other problem that I had is, is why does it appear here in Luke's account? You see, all the way through Luke, we've been saying Luke has got it together. He's organised things in such a way, a chronological order of telling you what Jesus did during his time of ministry. He's been round and talked to eyewitnesses. He's been very diligent about putting this account together for us. But actually, this little bit is a bit different. You see, it doesn't tell us even where Jesus was when this happened. It it doesn't fit in with what's going on, except, as Phil said, it's the start of his teaching ministry. As he set his face up towards Jerusalem and the end of his life, this is like the beginning of teaching the disciples how they're going to cope without him. It's as though Luke has just remembered something that happens so often and so frequently that he's just thought, this is really vital. Because this wasn't the first time they would have seen Jesus pray. All through his ministry, he would have stopped and prayed. So Luke has written it down for us here. He's had a sort of eureka moment. I'll put it here. I've I've forgotten that. I've taken it so much for granted. I'm going to put it here. The other thing that might have struck you as you were looking at it was that there are a few different versions of the Lord's Prayer. You went to school when I went to school, which looking around, some of you did, but not many. You probably went to a school where you would have recited the Lord's Prayer on various occasions. Some schools it might have been every day, some schools every assembly, some schools on just particular days of the week or days of the year. Not done in school these days. And you would have looked at a a traditional version of the Lord's Prayer, a traditional version which perhaps you've heard used in the church here. But most of us will be familiar with it. And it has some 
interesting additions to the one that we've just read, you might have felt shortchanged as Phil read tonight's reading. Because there's some interesting bits about this version of the Lord's Prayer. I'm told, although I might look as if I was, I wasn't around in the first century, but I'm told in the first century that the church leaders added to the text that we have. They added these words to the bottom. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the reason they added those bits, apparently, is because they didn't think a prayer to God should finish with concentration on sin and sinfulness. That they wanted to help lift the early Christians' eyes to heaven to praise and worship, uh, and a confirmation that it was God's world at a time when they were pressed for their faith. Also, if you're any sort of Bible scholar, you'll know there's a, a different version in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel says this. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. That's added. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Another piece that's added. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And add it again. But deliver us from the evil one. So what is this? (coughs) Who's got it right? Is it Matthew or Luke? Were they both wrong? Well, the thing is that prayer would be something that the Lord Jesus did on a regular basis. And I don't know about you, but I probably have to go back to Jesus a few times before I've got the message in my head. And he also wasn't given a prayer that said, this is how you need to pray. These are the words in this order, in this precise way, every time you pray. He's teaching them the sort of elements that need to be involved in the prayers. He's teaching them about how they can pray. What it is. What it is to pray. What the relationship is all about. So here is Luke's. Luke's version for us. One day... Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. What a wonderful thing to say. They've stood around perhaps several times, perhaps even more than that, and somebody's bold enough to say, wow, we want to get involved in this prayer thing. Not, oh, crumbs, he's doing it again. This is the boring bit of the day. Come on, let's get on to the miracles bit but we want to know. Tell us how we should pray. Just as John taught his disciples, you see, there was a tradition of religious leaders teaching their disciples about prayer. It's not something Jesus invented. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. So we'll start with the context. Right at the beginning. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. It starts off. One day, Jesus was playing in a certain place. They'd listen to him pray. They were interested in what he was saying. They wanted to know more. I I, I wonder whether they wanted to know what position they should be in to pray. Could they pray standing up or kneeling down? Did they need to prostrate themselves? Uh, Teach us how to pray. Oh, and why did they ask Jesus? Well, because he was their leader. He was somebody they were seeking to follow. But as I said, it wouldn't have been the first time they'd seen him pray. 
because Luke records for us lots and lots and lots of times when Jesus himself was praying. Uh, they're listed, some of them are listed on your sheets tonight. We'll go through them, some of them rapidly. So at his baptism, when John the Baptist took him into the water, he said, and as he was praying, heaven opened. As he was praying. It wasn't a big deal. He just was praying at his baptism. In Luke 5, 16, as the crowds pressed upon him, Jesus, but Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. They'd see him disappear off. Move away from where the hubbub was to a quieter place where he could pray. Luke 6, 12 said, before choosing the 12, here's a real crucial time as he chose the men that were going to lead the church forward after he was no longer with them. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Well, hold on a minute. Well, I'm getting a bit confused now about the Trinity. Aren't they all one, and but different bits of the same one, and yet Jesus is praying to God to find out which ones to choose? Is that how it works? Phil will teach us about Trinity some other time. I used an orange on Wednesday to teach the children about Trinity. It was quite good. I understood it. <coughs> but Jesus spent time praying about a decision that needed to be made. made. Luke 9, verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him. Luke 9, 28 and 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. What we know, what we sometimes call the transfiguration. As he was praying, it occurred. Luke 18 and verse 1, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should pray and not give up. Towards the end of his earthly ministry, in Luke 22, it says, But I have prayed for you, Simon. Depends how you say it, doesn't it? But I've prayed for you, Simon. But I've prayed for you, Simon. It was out of a sense of care and concern. Jesus knew the role that Simon Peter was going to take on, the responsibility of that role. And again in the same chapter, on the Mount of Olives, the night that he was arrested, why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. You see, Jesus prayed all the time. That's why Luke didn't forget about prayer. He knew how important it was, but what he'd forgotten is that he hadn't mentioned it before, about being asked about how to pray. So we move on. When he'd finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. You know, different teachers in that time, different Jewish teachers in that time might uh, speak, teach special sorts of forms of prayer to their own group of disciples. You, you might be able to hear how different people prayed and be able to place them under the guidance or leadership of a particular Jewish leader. There were some common prayers that they had. The Palestinian Jews had some prayers in common that they'd use at particular celebrations, at particular times. So prayer wasn't alien to the disciples. They would have known about prayer before they got to, to hear Jesus pray, but there was something special about his prayers. They, they weren't the same way that other leaders have been praying. Lord, teach us to pray. Isn't that a great request? Lord, teach us to pray, they said. And, but a great but very needful one. Jesus is the only one that can teach us to pray. By his word and by his spirit, he teaches us how to pray. 
Lord, teach me what it is to pray. Lord, stir up and encourage me to pray. Lord, direct me in what to pray. Those are directions that we all need. You know, teach me how to pray, what it is to pray. <laughs> Encourage me to pray. I, I know that it's important, but squeezing it into a busy lifestyle is really, really hard. Encourage me to pray. Lord, bring to my mind the things that I need to pray about. Help me know what to pray. When we get to the prayer itself. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us for our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Jesus began with an intimate, direct address. He begins with the word, Father. What a comfort. A simple but affirmative start brings. I, I don't know what your experience of father is. We all have different human fathers. Some of them we look around and think are better than others. Some of them we don't really appreciate until we can no longer tell them how much we appreciate them. But we can understand from our relationship with our fathers perhaps something of what it is to have a father who doesn't let you down. A father who doesn't do those bad things that perhaps our fathers might have done from time to time but a loving Heavenly Father. And sometimes we get a bit confused because as we come in prayer to our Heavenly Father, we think about our own fathers. And we think about those subterfuges we might have put in place when we hadn't done things quite as we should have done and we're trying to cover up something, but we know we're going to get found out anyway. Uh, perhaps you didn't have a childhood like mine. Perhaps you never did things that you didn't want your dad to know. Perhaps you never had those awkward conversations the night after you got in very late about where you've been and what you've been doing and you tried to fudge the issue a bit. Because we come to a Heavenly Father who before we come knows everything about us. Everything. But still loves us and loves us and loves us and loves us. In Jesus' model prayer, he makes five very simple requests. He starts off with this. The first two are to deal with God's interests. It says, hallowed be your name. The first request is that God's name is to be hallowed, to set apart or to be sanctified, or to be treated as holy. And, and that comes in myriad forms, doesn't it? As we use that word and, and, and as we reflect about our own prayer life, that's what we want. We want God's name to be lifted higher. Either because we're in the world around us, in our workplace or in our home or somewhere else, things are so out of control that we just want to lift God's name higher. Or perhaps because we haven't done the right things and just we want to realise how high the name of God is. We, we want to know that our God is supreme in heaven and that we can grasp hold of him as our loving Heavenly Father. The request is to, that God should be revered by men. The world around us, but more importantly, our own selves. A reminder that that's what our desire should be. One standard Jewish prayer of the day proclaimed, exalted and hallowed be your name, and may your kingdom come speedily and soon. God 
God's name would be hallowed and sanctified, shown holy in the end time when his kingdom will come. This theology is obviously entirely biblical. But there's a sense in which we're not only interested in the tomorrow, in the end of all times, we're interested in our today and the pressures that we face for being a believer the pressures that we face from our own selves, our sinful natures. We pray, hallowed be your name. The Old Testament followed <laughs> similar things. Isaiah 5.16, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice and the Holy God will show himself holy by his righteousness. Isaiah 29 and 23, when they, see, uh, when they see among them, their children, the work of my hand, they will keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. And there's some more references that talk about that holiness through Ezekiel. Ezekiel 36, 23. I will show the holiness of my great name. God says. Ezekiel 39.7 I will make known my holy name among my people. Zechariah 14 and verse 9 The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name will be the only name. Make my name holy. Make your name holy. The second request is that his kingdom should come. John the Baptist, Jesus, the Twelve, the Seventy-Two, all had preached about the coming of God's kingdom. But it wasn't a new idea for the people they were preaching it to. The Old Testament talks about the coming king. When a person prays for the coming of the kingdom, he's identifying with the message of Jesus and his followers. Is it something you pray for on a regular basis? Do we pray for it when things are bad? Because that will be our ultimate escape. We pray for it when things are good. As a very naive and young Christian, I remember praying that the Lord wouldn't come back until I'd met a wife, had children, till I'd done a few things and seen a few things. That was selfish. For the sinful world in which we live, are we praying that God's kingdom will come? Come in all your glory. Come and show yourself. End this sinful world in which we live. <coughs> so neither a selfish get us out of here prayer or a hold your, hold your horses, let's wait for a time when I'm ready, but a prayer to be subject to God's will and purpose. The third request. Give us each day our daily bread. Bread is a general term here, denoting nourishing and furling food. Thus it's a, for, a, a request for food necessary to receive life for the day. But this uh, request of the provision of God's daily bread, this manna, refers back, of course, to the Old Testament. But there's also a, a sense in which it's a spiritual feeding, a spiritual nourishment. As those people wandered around the desert and they were hungry and God provided with them physical daily manna to eat and sustain themselves, he was also showing them his powerful nature. He was also showing them his care and concern. He was also reminding them that what they needed day by day was they needed him in their lives day by day to love and to cherish to lead and to guide to watch over them, to protect them 
give us each day our daily bread has a physical sense to it, but a spiritual sense too. Sometimes we think it's more about one than the other, but it's not, it's a balance of both. A physical and a spiritual request for daily feeding. You know, we're provided with so much these days. There's so many good resources to help us with our daily feeding spiritually. I wonder whether we use them to their best. I wonder how good we're at keeping up with them. Uh, it, it's what? Middle of January. Most people who set New Year's resolutions at the beginning of January have long forgotten what they were. They alone kept them up. Uh, do we do that spiritually about our daily readings, our daily times of prayer? Give us each day. Give us each day our daily bread, our, our nourishment. And it's a reminder that God's provision is huge and immense and beyond anything that we could overuse. It's a reminder that we need to go daily to receive. It's not, God, don't forget us. I, I, you know, I need this on a daily basis. It's a, don't let me forget. Fourth request, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And the question is, can we really pray this prayer? Is that within our capabilities? Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. One of those really hard things. One of those really hard things that push in upon our earthly lives. Thinking of people that have been so unjust to us. And yet being able to forgive them because we've understood what God has forgiven us for. It's not easy. But that's what we're uh, inquired to give. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sinned against us. In Luke chapter 7, the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with them. A woman who'd lived a sinful life bought an alabaster jar of perfume. She wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She kissed his feet pour perfume on them. The Pharisees' reaction? You should know she's a sinner. Why are you letting her get that close to you? Why are you allowing her physical contact with you? Jesus' reaction? Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Forgiving sins? Forgiven as, forgiving sins as we forgive others? In asking forgiveness of sins, a person expresses their faith that God will forgive. Such a person then shows their faith by forgiving others find that easy? It's great when our finite minds finally grasp hold of all that God has forgiven from us and all that that means to us. That we can be called sons and daughters of the living God through what the Lord Jesus has done for us. And does that encourage us to forgive others?
Matthew 6 says. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. I put these verses in. But these verses really, really mess with my head. You see, it's a, it's a huge encouragement to be forgiving people. To be people who forgive and forgive and forgive. That annoying person that sits across the desk from you in the office that always takes your paper clips. That next door neighbour who keeps pouring his dog poo into your garden. verse says that if you don't forgive them and forgive them and forgive them you won't receive forgiveness and that does mess with my head because I believe that that point in my life when I gave my life to Jesus I was entirely forgiven of all my sin past, present and future and secured for me as a place in heaven with my Heavenly Father, not through my own abilities, not through what I was going to do or could do or the potential I was going to fulfill, but because of his saving grace. And I guess what this verse means is that because I understand all of that, the outflow of my, the grace I've received, the forgiveness I've received, I will forgive and forgive and forgive, and forgive. In Matthew 18, 23 to 35, a little story is told about a servant who's forgiven a huge debt, but treated a fellow servant harshly for a smaller debt. The master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I cancelled all, all the debt of yours, because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned, o- turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. That's such a warning to me. Not just say the words, but actually mean it from your heart. Forgive me as I forgive others. Mark says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. I'm not seeking to downplay the power of God in his forgiveness. What I'm saying is that there are standards expecting us of us as believers. In understanding about how much we've been forgiven is how much we ought to be willing to forgive those around us. And by no means am I, I hope, making it sound that God is harsh or unharsh unhelpful or unloving or uncaring. But this is what scripture says. Living in relationship with God requires constant repentance of the sins that plague us. You need to come to God constantly confessing and asking for forgiveness. Refusing to forgive others reveals a lack of appreciation. We all need forgiveness. We all blow it, head in the wrong direction, do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing. We need that 
close relationship with God that comes through confessing those sins, receiving his forgiveness, and then sharing that with those around us. Not just those nice people in the church, but those not so nice people that perhaps we meet in our daily work, our daily lives, the car that cuts us up, the pedestrian that jumps in front of the car, the person that shortchanges us, that annoying man we hide from when we see him coming. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Jesus, just as in Christ God forgave you. Colossians 3 and 13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Matthew 6, 15. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And back to Matthew 18, 27. The Master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. See, too many of us came into a relationship with God on the understanding that it was quite a sort of fluffy thing, perhaps. It was quite safe and secure. It was quite warm and comforting. We treat God more like a cuddly teddy bear, perhaps, than a great creator. Sometimes we need to remember that this God who created everything we can see around us, everything we know about, everything that we could possibly imagine, wants us to be his living testimony on earth. That other people will know about his greatness and his love and his compassion when they look at us. That's frightening. Well, that's what our, the expectation. My master took pity on me, cancelled my debt, and let me go. The thrift fifth request, lead us not into temptation. Finally, there's a request that God would help us as believers refuse to yield to temptation. The Greek word uh, translated temptation here means more likely that enticement or test or trial. This is a request for spiritual protection from those trials and temptation. But why is this necessary? Why is it necessary to ask God not to lead us into temptation? Surely we've said he's a loving Heavenly Father. He won't want us to be tempted. He doesn't want us to be sinful, so why tempt us? How do we get to this temptation? Well, perhaps the meaning here is that Jesus' followers are to pray that they are to be delivered from situations that would cause them to sin. Help me get, stop getting to those places where I feel obliged to tell lies. Help me avoid that shop where I spend so much of my money on those lovely sweets. Help me avoid those places where I know I'm going to be tested and yet seem drawn to all the time. Help me be wise. Help me understand your plan and purpose for my life, that I walk the way you'd have me walk, that I'd live a life you want me to live, that I do what you want me to do. Perhaps uh, the parables in the ancient prayers suggest that lead us into, not into testing means 
let's not sin when we are tested, rather than let's not be tested. Because of the world in which we live as believers, we're going to be tested. Because it's a sinful world. And there will be uh, trials and temptations. There will be stuff that we're faced with where we're going to have to make a choice. So, let's not sin when we're tested. So what have we got here? What's Jesus explaining to the disciples? And down through the ages, he's explaining to you and I, well, it's not rocket science. It's not something you've never heard before. It's not something new and fantastic. It's just incredibly precious privilege we're given to spend time with a loving Heavenly Father on a regular basis. It's not confined by a particular time of the day. It's not like the doctor's surgery where you get a time slot. And if you haven't quite managed to express your problem before the time's up, you just get some pills and send out again. This is an infinitely patient Heavenly Father who never rolls his eyes as you go back for more. This is a Heavenly Father who delights to hear you pray. A Heavenly Father who goes even further, who misses it when you don't pray. Much more than we miss it. Where is Pete today? I I, I haven't heard from him today. What's he doing? Why isn't he here? Well, he's certainly not going it his own way successfully. That's for sure. How should we approach it? Well, sometimes it will be just silence. Our prayers will be silent because we don't know what to say. Sometimes we might be shouting at God because we're frustrated. Sometimes we might be asking questions. Sometimes it might be a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Are these acceptable? Of course they are. Of course they are. This is dearly loved children. He loves to hear from us. To know what we're thinking and how we're thinking. Not that he needs to know, because he already knows. It doesn't come as a surprise to him or a shock. we can express our innermost feelings in just the way it pours out. Knowing that he loves us and cares for us. How should we use the prayer? As an encouragement. As an encouragement to pray. As an encouragement to bring these aspects to God on a regular basis. To know that prayer is there for our benefit. Should we learn it off, off by rote? Should we know the words? As a very young child, we perhaps were taught the Lord's Prayer and we had to recite it, either at Sunday school or at game at school, word for word. Got a reward at the end if you could remember it all and got it all right. Is that how we should use it? No, that's not what it's about. It's about an expression of a living relationship with a loving Heavenly Father who gets excited when we want to talk to him, whatever the subject matter, who's thrilled by the fact that we want to talk to him. We want to know him more and in a deeper way. Jesus did not tell his disciples till they asked because it was a secret. It's something that he wanted them to know. Wanted them to share with us. Wanted Luke and Matthew to write down so that we had some idea about what it should feel like, what it should look like. 
we should be encouraging each other, just as the disciples encouraged people in, those, in the early church to pray and to keep on praying. We should be encouraging each other to use the opportunity to pray. Not just in church situation, not just in group situation, but individually. If you don't talk with somebody you love, that begins to grow cold. Separation begins to creep in. Things begin to get difficult. We need to keep in contact. We need to keep in contact with our Heavenly Father. And we do that by something we call prayer. Out loud, in our heads, however it is, wherever it is, whenever it is on the bus, at our workplace, as we're doing other things. Long prayers, short prayers. Pray without ceasing, it says. Keeping it open all the time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so amazed about this opportunity that we have, this privilege that we have to come and to speak to you in groups, in individually, during the night, during the day, for short periods of time, for long periods of time, shouting, questioning, silent. You've given us a model of the sort of things we can come with. The sort of things you want to hear from us. We thank you that you know everything about us and yet want us to come and to share that with you. Encourage our hearts. Help us to realise that there's no right or wrong prayer. Our relationship with you grows as we spend time with you, reading your word and speaking with you in prayer. Help us each one to grow in prayerfulness, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.